We're reading the scriptures from Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and we're commencing the reading at the verse 39. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. And they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. <coughs> and when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? They understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. May God bless that reading to our hearts this morning. Let us bow our head in a wee word of prayer. O God, before us this morning is thy word, thine open word. Be pleased now by thy spirit to so open our hearts to receive that ingrafted word of living truth. For Lord, this is living truth. Make it both a blessing and a challenge to our hearts this morning, I pray. Grant, Lord, you'll meet one of us, this, you'll meet every one of us this morning here as our individual need, Lord, would demand. And you know that need, Lord, this morning better than we know it ourselves. Reveal it too as we pray. And grant, O oh God, to be pleased to spread Thy table of good things in our midst this morning, and unto thee will ascribe all the praise, honour and glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. My text this morning is found in the words of verse 44. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk, and acquaintances. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. Previous in this chapter, Joseph and Mary had taken the young child Jesus <coughs> at a very tender age to the temple. <coughs> To have done with him according to the customs of the law. You find that there in the verse 39. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they, tarry, they turned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. They returned home. And for the next 12 years, the veil is drawn. We know nothing about the Saviour's life. But then whenever we come to verse 40, that veil is drawn aside for a little while, just momentarily, and then once again it's drawn by the hand of divinity. And for the next 18 years, we know nothing about the Saviour. 
And so, as we think about the miracle and the mystery of his birth, we're told very much about those two things, right throughout the Old Testament, and very much so in the New. But of those hidden years, we are told absolutely nothing. Here in verse 41, the veil is drawn. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. This is the last glimpse we get of the Saviour until until he is revealed again more than eighteen years later. But there's some things that I learn from this reading. Maybe you know of them, maybe you don't. But this, in this chapter, is the first recorded words of the Saviour's earthly ministry. The first words he spoke that were recorded. You'll find them here in this chapter 2. That's the first thing I learn. But the second thing I learn is this. I learn that Jesus at 12 years of age knew who he was. Whenever mothers and fathers are rearing their children, the first words that teach them to say is Mama and Dada. And by using that method, they come to know who their mom and dad really is. <coughs> Jesus was taught in the self-same manner. Mary taught Jesus that Joseph was his father. After all, looking at a young boy of four, five, six, up to twelve years of age, to tell that young boy that God is your father... It might have been a wee bit confusing. So Mary told her son Jesus that Joseph was his father. And the reason I say that is because of the latter part of verse 48. And when they saw him they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So there's the proof of it. She taught Jesus the way that any mother or father would teach their son or teach their daughter. After all, to tell, as I have said, a a young boy at 12 years of age, God to your father, might have been confusing. But despite it all, Jesus knew who he was. He didn't need any such teaching or any earthly parent. He knew exactly who he was. Because in verse 49, whenever Mary says, Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing, here is his rebuke, a gentle chiding. Here's what it is in verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? For there's the proof. As a boy of 12 years of age, by his, the, the, the divine spirit that was within him, he knew who his father was. Now there's something else I learned from this chapter. I learned that Joseph, his earthly guardian, must have died shortly after this was written. Because this is the last time there's any reference ever made to Joseph. When Mary with the other Mary stand by the cross, Jesus looks down and there's his beloved, his beloved disciple. To Mary, your son. To the beloved disciple, John, your mother. So Joseph must have died somewhere in between. We don't know how soon. We don't know how long, but it was somewhere after this was recorded here. 
These words that I have read that teach me something else. Something very important. Something applicable to you and me. And it is this. They went a day's journey and they wished not that Jesus was, with, was not with them. Now what I learn from these words is this. It's possible to have a relationship with Jesus Christ but not to have fellowship with him. And that applies to all of God's people. Yes, Jesus was missing. The sun was missing. There they're traversing for a day and suddenly they look for him but he's not there. Just one day. The relationship was there. He was still their son. He was still Mary's son. But the fellowship wasn't there. And that's one thing that's very important in the Christian life. To know both the relationship and also to know the fellowship. Now to expand that and reveal it a wee bit more, let me say first of all that Mary found a life. She found a life. She found a life in this son. For 12 years. And it's possible that when he was those uh, tender days old they took him to the temple from then until he was 12 he was never back in the temple they went every year to the temple and for those 12 years at Nazareth her life had been so closely associated with her son Jesus she found this life Every day, and possibly all day, mother and precious son had been together. Now, just think about this. Think about the companionship she would have had. There in the home, every day, coming out and going in. Now, Mary knew who Jesus was. She didn't teach that Joseph was his father out of despite. She knew exactly who Jesus was. I think she did it uh, because she was seeking to safeguard her son. How would he understand if she said, you're the son of God? So she was tender. She was loving. She was caring. She was understanding. But what a companionship she found. Mary would look back and Mary was a kind of woman like any good mother is that would hide the things about her children in her heart. She would carry those things about her children from the day they were born Yes, and God forbid if they exited this world before them, she would carry them right through life. In chapter 1, verse 30 and 35, she would remember the words of the angel whenever he came with the news that she was to bear the Messiah. Chapter 1, 30 down through to 35. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And on down it goes on to explain what the angel said, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary would never forget those words. They were written indelibly upon her heart. 
nor would she ever forget her visit to Elizabeth. It was to bear John the Baptist. Because Elizabeth spoke prophetic and memorable words to her at that time. And again, I believe she had these in her heart. The words that uh, Elizabeth spoke to Mary, the mother of my God. There's something else she would hide in her heart. And not only so, but the first time as a baby when they took him to the temple, that old Simeon took him up in his arms. And spoke certain things to Mary. And Anna the prophetess took him up in his arms. And spoke certain things to Mary. Those were the things she had in her heart. Old Simeon told her that the very steel of sorrow would pierce her lovely heart. Would she forget those things? No. She knew who Jesus was. Though she taught him in this uh, family thing a little differently. But you know, what Mary bore in the flesh, what Elizabeth spoke about spiritually, what Simeon and Anna held in their arms, and Mary kept in her home for those years up until he came the age to undertake his public ministry. You and I, what they had in their arms, what Mary had in her home, you and I, if you're saved, you have in your heart. He was born of Mary according to the flesh, not the sinful flesh, the Spirit of God, holy flesh. He's born of the Spirit in the hearts of his people. So you see there, Mary had companionship, but you and I have closer companionship. Oh, how nice it would have been to have been able to walk around Israel and see the Lord, and nicer even to walk with the Lord. Yes, wonderful, wonderful experience. But then you see, in those days the Lord could only be one place at once. Today he's with you, today he's with me. Today he's with every believer across the world because he's with us in the Spirit. He's born of the Holy Spirit in our life. So you see the similarity of the companionship here. It's a greater companionship. It's a greater closeness. Closer than a brother. Born in our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. But then not only did Mary have the companionship, Mary also had the communion. How precious those 12 years must have been between mother and son. How precious they must have been, we will never know. But again and again, we read that as Mary had those things that I have mentioned in her heart, I'm sure that everything in that home I'm sure every conversation, I'm sure everything she saw, everything she heard, everything was spoken, she would hide in her heart forever as she watched them grow. Verse 40, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. What communion she must have had. But you know, it was only one like the Lord Jesus, the just one, who could make that communion blossom in that home every day. And so it is with you and me. It is only that living Saviour, born in our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, that can make communion sweet and the fragrance of that communion sweet to you and I as God's children every day. You see, Mary sought him every day. Mary was with him every day. And what days those must have been for those next 12 years 
I said that Mary knew who he was, and so she did. In chapter 1 and verse 47, Mary says these words. She says, God my Savior. She knew exactly who he was. Let's personalize this then a wee bit. Her companionship, her communion, her fellowship. She was with that young lad of 12 years of age right up to that time. And I'm sure she shared very many things with him. And I'm sure that he shared very many things with her. That's all a great part of the Christian life. Realizing, first of all, that that same Son, that that same Savior, has shared all that He is with us. And surely it is to be be expected that we can come and share all that we are with Him. He gives us His righteousness. He takes away our sin. He takes away uh, the wicked rags of our self-righteousness and religion. He gives to the spotless robe of righteousness pure white and linen. So you see, once again here, there is a similarity. Mary found a life when Jesus was born. It is not true, dear soul, that every one of us here he was saved only began to live when the Lord Jesus Christ was born in her heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can say that personally. I'm sure you can say it equally as well. Oh, we thought life was out in the world. We thought life was of the world's crowd. We thought life was savouring the world's pleasures. But not until we came and bowed the knee at Calvary, repented of our sin, and said, Lord Jesus, I will trust thee, did life really begin. And thank God for some here. That's many years ago. And the blessed thing about it is, it's still continuing. And the best is yet to be. Mary had that companionship and that fellowship. There was a life that Mary found. But then there's something else here. A wee bit solemn. There was a loss that Mary should have feared. The reason I have emphasized the closeness of that relationship was to teach a little something. And it is that no matter how close you may feel yourself to the Lord, there's always a possibility of losing the fellowship. We're never beyond that possibility. We're never beyond the reach of the enemy of our soul. There was a loss that Mary should have feared and that all of us should fear. Probably as I have said, this was the first time Jesus had been back to the temple uh, since his circumcision and the customs of the law were carried out upon him. It was Jewish tradition that when a male reached the age of 12, he passed from boyhood into manhood. That's the reason why they took him to the temple. Because he had now come to the age when he was passing from boyhood into manhood, and one of the obligations of that was that he would attend the Passover. The Passover lasted seven days. The priests were in the temple for seven days, counselling and instructing the people. But Mary and Joseph left before the seven days were expired. How do we know that? Well, two days was the minimum period one could spend. If someone came from a far distance, which Joseph and Mary and Jesus did, then they were allowed to leave after two days. How do we know? Well, 
They left and they went a day's journey and they discovered someone was missing. You see, were they too busy talking about all they had seen and all they had heard and all the friends they had met? Why was this a situation? Were they too caught up with uh, all they had experienced over the past two days and uh, meeting friends and talking to them and this, that and the other and a whole lot of other things? So whenever they found he was missing, away they go back again. But it was three days before they found him. Three days. Now, if they had listened to what Jesus said originally, they would have gone to the temple first of all. But apparently they didn't. Because Jesus said, Wist ye not that I must be about my Father's business? Another interpretation is, Wist ye not that I must be in my Father's house? So why did they spend three days looking for him? And how we know that Mary and Joseph left after two days? Well, we know this because the priests were in the temple construct, uh, instructing and counseling the people for seven days. If they had stayed five days, if they had stayed four days, a day's journey, three days searching for him, the temple would have been empty. No priest would have been there. After seven days, the temple was closed. They would have found the closed door. That's how we know they left the feast early. But, they, how did they go about their search? There are many people like this today. They're looking for something. <laughs> Something precious. <coughs> Say, for example, they're looking for salvation. What do they do? They try here, they try there, they try yonder, they try this, they try that, and they try the other. Do they find it? No. Where do they find it? In the place they should have gone to, first of all. But you see, it is our nature. I can't point the finger at any one person because it is our nature. Whenever problems come our way, that we do what we can to solve them the best we can. But how much easier it would be if we put God first and brought the problem to His mercy seat. As I said, it is human nature to do all we can in our power, as Mary and Joseph did in their search. They, 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 they maybe asked among friends, and they tried here, and they tried there, they tried somewhere else, and they forgot the word that Jesus spoke, Wish ye not that I must be in my Father's house. Verse 44, And they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And then in the verse uh, 46. It came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Wouldn't it have been a lot easier? And it would be much easier for you and me, dear believer, if we brought things that trouble us and cause us anxiety to the Lord first in prayer. You see, God is interested in the little things in our life. The world out there is looking for big things, gigantic things, massive numbers. But God has taken the one here and the one there and the one somewhere else because one with God is a majority. So you see, no matter, no matter how close we may feel we are to the Lord and walking with Him, there's always the danger. There's always that to be feared. We could very easily lose fellowship. The relationship's still there, but the fellowship 
is no longer. To do certain things and to seek out certain things, if they're good and upright, there's no harm in them. But sometimes we can find ourselves so busy doing this, doing that, something else, we miss out on spending time with God and His Word. Now, how many have spent hours on the computer this week? How many have spent hours sending texts and tweets and all that? Not that I understand these things. Whenever I was wee, I knew about tweets because there were things with paper on them and I would ask my mother, are you any tweets? <laughs> That's all I know about tweets. That's all I want to know, thank God for it. We live in a computer world, but we're living in a real world. I don't watch much TV. I'd watch an odd quiz program. I'd watch an odd antique program. That's the height of it. I have many reasons for doing that. I never was, I never will be addicted to it. But you see, when those adverts come on, if you're not stupid before they come on, you're stupid after they've gone off. They're neither rhyme nor reason in them. And that's how the God of this world captivates the mind. I remember calling in with an old man on a place called, but now, Bob Brashane. John T., he called him. John was a great old Christian gentleman. He belonged to the brethren. I was in one day, and I wasn't saved at the time. I'd like to hear the story John told. But anyway, this man said, John, you've no television. Oh, John says, I have television. He said, and John's fingers were nard arthritis, and... Uh, he, had, uh, he had bad feet and he was practically 95% an invalid. He had a wee garage and a man run the garage for him. Oh, I, John says, he, I had television. He says, and where do you keep it? They keep it upstairs. Oh, no, he said, I don't go upstairs. I sleep downstairs. You keep it in the back room. Oh, no, he says, I keep it beside me. He says, this is my television. This is news for yesterday. This is news for today. This is news for tomorrow. And how right he was. John kept that book there. It was gnarled, it was torn, it was of a yellow age. But John loved it. <clears throat> Remember he was telling a story. Uh, he was uh, he walked down from Bucknau no, down to Glenarm to take a meeting in one of the brethren halls down there. And down there they were a wee bit more liberal, they had an organ. And he came up to his own assembly the following Sunday and uh, one of the men said to him, I know this man. He said, Brother John, you're down at Glenarm last uh, Lord's Day. I was. And they have a wooden brother there. <laughs> oh, I do, he says. But John was just a wee bit more liberal and thank God for it. And uh, this man said to him, he said, Brother John, I wonder what the Apostle Paul would say if he came and saw the wooden brother in the corner. Uh, John always started, boy, oh boy, he says, I don't know, he says, but I don't know what Paul would say about that, but I wonder what he would say if he came and saw all those silver chariots out in the car park. <laughs> <laughs> John would never stop for an answer. But anyway, there is a loss here to be feared. It's very easy to lose fellowship. But one final point, because my time is gone. Not only was the life that was born, the uh, life that was found, a loss to be feared, but there was a Lord to be faced. That's the position of every one of us. In the verse forty-six, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Now, Jesus didn't say these exact words. But it is quite obvious from what he did say that you say, Joseph is my father. But I am telling you that I am the son of God. She had to meet with him. 
she had to face him. Because down there in the verse 48, And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowly. She made it appear it was his fault. Why have you dealt with us? And that's the way it is with us. We'd be readier to blame others than to blame ourselves. I remember when we lived in Cold Rain, I had a golden retriever and I walked her with me and you around the block. I went down the wee path, which was a shortcut to Cold Rain, and then I turned right up to the roundabout and in the main drive. If you went turned left, you were in Cold Rain maybe in five, six minutes. But anyway, I was going down to the dog one day and I met this lady and I spoke to her. And you never answered me. A few days later, same thing, I spoke to her, she never answered me. And that time, the old Adamic nature began to rise. I came in and said to my wife, I met a woman down the pathway there. I spoke to her the last day I met her. I spoke to her there today. She never answered me. She'll speak to me the next time before I speak to her. You see, that's the old, that's the old, that's what's in us. So, that was okay. Following week, I was down in cold rain and I saw this lady She was standing talking to somebody. But not the way I'm speaking to you. We're going this way. She was stone deaf. Doing sign language. When I saw that, it was like hitting me with a brick. I couldn't wait to get back home to get down before the Lord and ask God to forgive me. You see how wrong it was. And very often, maybe the wrong is with us. But it's very easy and we're very prone to blame those boys. But maybe whenever we look within, we can see a lot of things here. Because it's with the Lord we have to do. It's with him. Not with the session, yes, in a sense. Not with the minister, yes, in a sense. But it is with the Lord ultimately. Romans 14 and 12. So then every one of us must give account of himself unto God. Listen to Psalm 9 and 8. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Acts 17.31 Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man whom he hath ordained. That appointed day is coming. But thank God for those who are saved. It's not an appointment of the great white throne. It's an appointment with a throne of mercy. You see, Mary wanted to shift the blame onto Jesus. It's the easy way out. But he would have none of it. Wished ye not that it must be about my father's business. So there's a life to be found. There's a loss to be feared. And there is a Lord to be faced. Thank God for those who were saved. They came face to face with him. Some of you many years ago. And thank God you're still there. With all our weaknesses, our failures, our shortcomings. Praise God. He has not cast us out. And never will. I will never leave thee. Nor forsake thee. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Let's bring our meeting to a close in prayer. Heavenly Father, bless thy word this morning, I pray. O oh God, not only bless it, but make it a blessing to us. Take us now to our several homes in safety. Keep your hand upon us as we journey on the road. 
and until Jesus comes or calls, keep us looking unto him, the author and finisher of our faith. Just to ensure that every day he is by our side, and to know that nothing shall pluck us out of his hand. May the grace of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest, abide, and be with us, both now and